Hello and welcome to How to Econ. Today we will talk about production costs. This chapter is the first of four chapters that explores the theory of the firm. This theory explains how firms behave. We will talk about explicit and implicit costs and accounting and economic profits. Then we will talk about production costs in the short run and in the long run. So what do we mean by the firm? A firm or producer or business combines inputs of labor, capital, land, and raw or finished component materials to produce outputs. If the firm is successful, the outputs are more valuable than the inputs. This activity of production goes beyond manufacturing, which means making things. It includes any process or service that creates value, including transportation, distribution, wholesale, and retail sales. Production involves a number of important decisions that define a firm's behavior. These decisions include, but are not limited to, what products should the firm produce, how should the firm produce the products, how much output should the firm produce, what price should the firm charge for its products, how much labor should the firms employ. The answers to these questions depend on the production and cost conditions facing each firm. That is the subject of this chapter. The answers also depend on the market structure, which is a multidimensional concept that involves how competitive the industry is. We will look into different market structures in other videos. Let's examine how firms determine their cost and desired profit levels. Then we will discuss the origins of cost both in the short run and long run. Now, each business, regardless of size or complexity, tries to earn a profit, which is the difference between total revenue and total cost. Total revenue is the income the firm generates from selling its products. We calculate it by multiplying the price of the product and quantity of output sold. Total cost is what the firm pays for producing and selling its products. Recall that production involves the firm converting inputs to outputs. Each of those inputs has a cost to the firm. The sum of all those costs is total cost. We can distinguish between two types of cost, explicit and implicit. Explicit costs are out-of-pocket costs, that is, actual payments, wages that a firm pays its employees, or rent that a firm pays for its office, are explicit costs. Implicit costs are more subtle, but just as important. They represent the opportunity cost of using resources that the firm already owns. Implicit cost also includes the depreciation of goods, materials, and equipment that are necessary for a company to operate. Let's take a look at a numerical example. Assume that you need $100,000 to start your business. The interest rate is 5%. If you borrow $100,000, then the interest is $100,000 times 5% equals $5,000. This is an explicit cost that you have to pay to the bank where you borrow your money. But if you use $40,000 of your savings and borrow the other $60,000, then the explicit cost is only $3,000, which is 5% times $60,000 and you get $3,000. The implicit cost is $2,000, which is the foregone interest you could have earned on your $40,000 in savings. These two definitions of cost are important for distinguishing between two conceptions of profit, accounting profit, and economic profit. Accounting profit is a cash concept. It means total revenue minus explicit cost, which is the difference between dollars brought in and dollars paid out. Economic profit is total revenue minus total cost, including both explicit and implicit cost. The difference is important because even though a business pays income taxes based on its accounting profit, whether or not it is economically successful depends on its economic profit. Consider the following example. Alex currently works for a corporate law firm. 
he is considering opening his own legal practice where he expects to earn $200,000 per year once he establishes himself. To run his own firm, he would need an office and a law clerk. He has found the perfect office, which rents for $50,000 per year. He could hire a law clerk for $35,000 per year. If these figures are accurate, could Alex's legal practice be profitable? First of all, the explicit costs are office rental and law clerk salary. Totally, it is $85,000. Accounting profit equals revenue minus explicit costs, so it is $200,000 minus $85,000, which is $115,000. However, to open his own practice, Alex would have to quit his current job where he is earning an annual salary of $125,000. This would be an implicit cost of opening his own firm. The economic profit is revenue minus explicit cost minus implicit cost, which is $200,000 minus $85,000 minus $125,000 equals negative $10,000. So Alex could be losing $10,000 per year. That does not mean he would not want to open his own business, but it does mean that he could be earning $10,000 less than if he worked for the corporate firm instead of opening his own corporate law firm. Implicit costs can include other things as well. Maybe Alex values his leisure time and starting his own firm would require him to put in more hours than at the corporate firm. In this case, the lost leisure could also be an implicit cost that would subtract from economic profits. Now that we have an idea about the different types of costs, let's look at cost structures. A firm's cost structure in the long run may be different from that in the short run. The short run is the period of time during which at least some factors of production or inputs are fixed. For example, during the period of the pizza restaurant lease, the pizza restaurant is operating in the short run because it is limited to using the current building. The long run is the period of time during which all factors are variable. Back to the pizza restaurant example, once the lease expires for the pizza restaurant, the shop owner can move to a larger or smaller place. When factors of production cannot easily be increased or decreased in a short period of time, we call them fixed inputs. In the pizza example, the building is a fixed input. Once the entrepreneur signs the lease, he or she is stuck in the building until the lease expires. Fixed inputs define the firm's maximum output capacity. Variable inputs are those that can easily be increased or decreased in a short period of time. The pizza restaurant can order more ingredients with a phone call, so ingredients could be variable inputs. The owner could hire a new person to work quickly as well. So, a worker is a variable input. We should also introduce a critical concept, marginal product. Marginal product of labor is the additional output of one more worker. Mathematically, marginal product is the change in total product divided by the change in labor. Diminishing marginal product is a characteristic of production in the short run. Law of diminishing marginal productivity is a general rule that as a firm employs more labor, eventually the amount of additional output produced will decline, given the ceteris paribus condition or everything else stays constant. In order to produce outputs, firms need to use labor and physical capital such as workers, machines, raw material, and factories. For each input, there's an associated cost that a firm pays for the use of it in their production process. These are called production costs. Let's take a closer look at a firm's cost. We can decompose costs into fixed and variable costs. Fixed costs are the cost of the fixed inputs. Because fixed inputs do not change in the short run, fixed costs are expenditures that do not change regardless of the level of production. 
fixed costs can take many other forms. For example, the cost of machinery or equipment to produce the product, research and development costs to develop new products, even an expense like advertising to popularize a brand name. The amount of fixed costs varies according to the specific line of business. Variable costs are the cost of the variable inputs, for example, labor. The only way to increase or decrease output is by increase or decreasing the variable inputs. Therefore, variable costs increase or decrease with output. We treat labor as a variable cost since producing a greater quantity of a good or service typically requires more workers or more work hours. Variable costs would also include raw materials. Total costs are the sum of fixed plus variable costs. Sometimes firms need to look at their cost per unit of output, not just their total cost. There are two ways to measure per unit cost. The most intuitive way is average cost. Average cost or average total cost is the cost on average of producing a given quantity. We define average cost as total cost divided by the quantity of output produced. The other way of measuring cost per unit is marginal cost. If average cost is the cost of the average unit of output being produced, marginal cost is the cost producing one more unit. We calculate marginal cost by taking the change in total cost and dividing it by the change in quantity. We obtain average variable cost when we divide variable cost by quantity of output. And if we take fixed cost divided by quantity of output, we will get average fixed cost. Average total cost includes average variable cost and average fixed cost. Alright, so one more time. We calculate average total cost, ATC, by dividing total cost by the total quantity produced. The average total cost curve is typically U-shaped. We calculate average variable cost, AVC, by dividing variable cost by the quantity produced. The average variable cost curve lies below the average total cost curve and is also typically U-shaped. We calculate marginal cost MC by taking the change in total cost between two levels of output and dividing by the change in output. The marginal cost curve is upward sloping. The marginal cost line intersects the average cost line exactly at the bottom of the average cost curve. The reason why the intersection occurs at this point is built into the economic meaning of marginal and average cost. If the marginal cost of production is below the average cost for producing previous units, as it is for the points to the left of where marginal cost crosses ATC curve, then producing one more additional unit will reduce average cost overall, and the average total cost curve will be downward sloping in this zone. Conversely, if the marginal cost of production for producing an additional unit is above the average cost for producing the earlier units, as it is for points to the right of where marginal cost crosses average total cost curves, then producing a marginal unit will increase average cost overall, and the average total cost curve, the ATC curve, must be upward sloping in this zone. The point of transition between where MC is pulling ATC down and where it is pulling ATC up must occur as the minimum point of the average total cost ATC curve. This idea of the marginal cost pulling down the average cost or pulling up the average cost may sound abstract, but think about it in terms of your own grades. If the score on the most recent quiz you take is lower than your average score on previous quizzes, then the marginal quiz pulls down your average. If your score on the most recent quiz is higher than the average on previous quizzes, the marginal quiz pulls up your average. In this same way, low marginal cost of production first pull down average costs and then higher marginal costs pull them up later. Now, whatever the firm's quantity of production, 
total revenue must exceed total cost if it is to earn a profit. We have profit equals total revenue minus total cost. If we provide profit by the quantity of output produced, we get the average profit, also known as the firm's profit margin. Average cost tells a firm whether it can earn profits given the current price per unit in the market. If the market price is above average cost, then average profit and thus total profit will be positive. If price is below average cost, then profits will be negative or we say that we have a loss. Beside that, we can compare the marginal cost of producing an additional unit with the marginal revenue gained by selling that additional unit to reveal whether the additional unit is adding to total profit or not. Thus, marginal cost helps producers understand how increasing or decreasing production affects profits. Now, let's take a look at production in the long run. The long run is the period of time when all costs are variable. The long run depends on the specifics of the firm in question. It is not a precise period of time. If you have a one-year lease on your factory, then the long run is any period longer than a year, since after a year, you are no longer bound by the lease. No costs are fixed in the long run. A firm can build new factories and purchase new machinery, or it can close existing facilities. In planning for the long run, the firm will compare alternative production technologies or production methods. A firm will search for the production technology that allows it to produce the desired level of output at the lowest cost. After all, lower costs lead to higher profits, at least if total revenues remain unchanged. Moreover, each firm must fear that if it does not seek out the lowest cost methods of production, then it may lose sales to competitor firms that find a way to produce and sell for less. Once a firm has determined the least costly production method or technology, it can consider the optimal scale of production or quantity of output to produce. Many industries experience economies of scale. Economies of scale refers to the situation where, as the quantity of output goes up, the cost per unit goes down. This is the idea behind warehouse stores like Costco or Walmart. In everyday language, a larger factory can produce a lower average cost than a smaller factory. While in the short run, firms are limited to operating on a single average cost curve corresponding to the level of fixed cost they have chosen. In the long run, when all costs are variable, they can choose to operate on any average cost curve. Therefore, the long run average cost LRAC curve is actually based on a group of short run average costs SRAC curves, each of which represents one specific level of fixed cost. More precisely, the long run average cost curve will be the least expensive average cost curve for any level of output. The figure on the screen shows how we built the long-run average cost curve from a group of short-run average cost curves. Five short-run average cost curves appear on the diagram. Each short-run average cost curve represents a different level of fixed cost. For example, you can imagine SRAC1 as a small factory, SRAC2 as a medium factory, SRAC3 as a large factory, and SRAC4 and SRAC5 as very large and ultra-large companies or factories. Although this diagram shows only five short-run average cost curves, presumably there are an infinite number of other short-run average cost curves between the ones that we show. The long-run average cost LRAC curve shows the lowest cost for producing each quantity of output when fixed cost can vary and so it is formed by the bottom edge of the family of short-run average cost curves. The shape of the long-run cost curve in this figure is fairly common for many industries. The left-hand portion of the long-run average cost curve, where it is downward sloping from output levels Q1 to Q2 to Q3, illustrates the case of economies of scale. Remember that economies of scale refers to the situation where, as the quantity of output goes up, the cost per unit goes down. 
In the middle portion of the long run average cost curve, the flat portion of the curve around Q3, economies of scale have been exhausted. In this situation, allowing all inputs to expand does not much change the average cost of production. We call this constant returns to scale. In this long run average cost curve range, the average cost of production does not change much as scale rises or falls. Finally, the right-hand portion of the long-run average cost curve running from output level Q4 to Q5 shows a situation where as the level of output and the scale rises, average costs rise as well. We call this situation diseconomies of scale. A firm or a factory can grow so large that it becomes very difficult to manage, resulting in unnecessarily high costs as many layers of management try to communicate with workers and with each other, and as failures to communicate lead to disruptions in the flow of work and materials. This is it for the production cost topic. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.